Dear attendees, uh, we are happy to see you at our webinar Should Apple pay, pay 13 billion penalty to EU? And our today presenters are Richard Bolvine, Xi Jin Chan, and Steve Haubreste. Uh, and I would like to inform you that you can ask your questions uh, through the control panel of GoToWebinar, uh, and you will see the uh, questions panel, or you can type your questions in the chat box. Uh, the questions will be answered in the flow of webinar or otherwise at the end of webinar. Thank you. The panelists, you can start the webinar. Okay, uh, are, are we on? Yes, we are on. Okay, uh, okay, good afternoon everyone from the people in the European side. And uh, this is Sejin Chang, I'm calling from Shanghai in China. So this is a good night. Uh, it's a 10 p.m. In, uh, in the middle of the night, and uh, people from the North America will be in the morning. So welcome to our webinar. And this webinar has grown out of a session in the recent meeting of the Strategic Society in September in Berlin, Germany. So uh, we have uh, for three uh, speaker today, uh, Richard Bowen coming from the UNCTA. Uh, he's a chief uh, economist in the business facilitation. And uh, Steve is from the, the Transport Pricing Associate. And uh, Lorraine, uh, she couldn't make it, so I'm, I'm presenting a slide as well. So the, the ti as a title suggests, uh, there is a recent event for the Apple uh, to be fined. Actually, the island government was fined for $13 billion. Uh, for the tax uh, penalty, and uh, some of the, some of you may be wondering, you know, why uh, suddenly the EU has assigned such a huge penalty against Apple and to the island. But in fact, Apple paid no tax to any country, including the United States, uh, by managing global sales through the paper company located in Ireland during 2009 and 2012. And Apple paid only $6 billion tax for $50 billion profit in 2012, and is holding a lot of cash abroad. But uh, the Apple case is not an isolated case. And if you look at the other the second page, there is a Microsoft did the same thing uh, to avoid the tax. And the Starbucks avoid the tax in the UK, even though its sales is more than 400 million pounds. And they pay just a little bit of a 8.6 million dollar million pound tax uh, in 2012. Uh, so, so uh, this uh, kind of event uh, shows that you know tax avoidance and there's a. Uh, is a serious event, and there's a huge conflict between the national government and the multinational company. So as I introduce, uh, 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 the, the, I am at the, the National Institute of Singapore, and Steve and Richard will be the speaker uh, for this uh, webinar. So let me start with the why uh, this become an important issue. From the government's perspective and from the multinational perspective, and from the research perspective of the, uh, of the academics. Okay? Uh, so uh, Lorraine Eden, uh, she's an expert on transfer pricing and income shifting. And I'm also working on the uh, income shifting from the very much academic perspective. So let's start with the why this has become an important issue for the government. So on the next page, uh, from the government perspective, Transfer pricing is regarded as abusive. So multinational company, as we know, play a very important role in the global economy. It's uh, representing about 11% GDP. But you may notice that uh, the late party transaction, so which means that multinationals are headquarter uh, and multinationals pay a subsidiary and among the, the, their subsidiaries, uh, the, this late party transaction uh, trade represents about the half of the U.S. export and the 30% of the U.S. import. And the four all OECD countries, they represent about 8 to 15%. So which means that 
you know, limit party transaction and the transfer pricing has a huge impact to the, our country's balance of payment and economic development. So this become a very important issue for the government uh, who is interested in the value added and the tax, uh, tax for that particular national government. And therefore the abusive transfer pricing has attracted attention from the many national government and invite regulation. But uh, to be fair, the, uh, the, there's a global norm of what is the, uh, what, which kind of the transfer pricing is abusive or is not abusive. The theoretical answer is that the arm length price. So if the transfer pricing is close to the arm length price, uh, it is not abusive. But the, the question is that what is the arm length price which is not clear at all to the government and also the multinational company. So for example, in the next slide, there is an example of the penalty of the punishing of which is uh, principal pricing. Depending upon the range, there can be a 20% penalty and a 40% penalty beside this range. But the critical question to the uh, multinational company is that, you know, it's not very, very clear. But uh, from the uh, perspective of national government, and uh, they are going after this obviously transfer pricing practices. So on the next page, uh, we listen to the, the, the problem from the multinational company's perspective. So multinational company, uh, they have uh, the transport pricing play a very different law. For their internal purpose, the transport pricing work as a signal, and they use the transport pricing to allocate the resources, and they also regulate you know, inter intra firm flow. And also the transport pricing is important to evaluate the performance of the affiliate and also the managers of the, the affiliate of the uh, multinational subsidiaries. But there are some external motivation too. So if the corporate income tax is different from each country, and uh, as we understand, the multinational company, they, they, they bought, they purchased the input from the lowest possible uh, price from any country, and they try to sell to go to global to customers, and of course, they obviously want to minimize the tax on a global basis. Okay? And there was a tariff and the foreign exchange control and some country ex uh, impose some joint venture requirement. And also there can be a restriction of the, whether you can send your profit, uh, profit uh, repatriation. And there are many other regulations. So multinational company, from the multinational company's perspective, they have to set the transfer pricing uh, by balancing this internal and external motivation. So purely, if you take the shareholder perspective, and if you, uh, if you do not break the legal code of the tax code of, a foreign of that country, then there's a no problem. As long as you, 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 you pay your tax into the legal code, and uh, it can be perfectly online, and it can be perfectly legal. But if you take a stakeholder perspective, if you consider that the, you are not just responsible for your own shareholder, but to the national government and also the resident of those countries, and the transport pricing uh, can be legal, but it can be immoral. Uh, but from the multinational pers um, company perspective, uh, there's a quite serious uh, risk involved in the transfer pricing. So as is shown in the next page, and uh, what is not clear is that there's a no single arm length price that they work for every country. So oftentimes, uh, the arm length price is not a single uh, price point that is a rather a range of prices. Okay? So the transfer pricing could be either inside or outside the range. And the, uh, each country use their own method to determine or uh, its own arm length price range. So depending upon what kind of method they use and uh, your transfer pricing can be inside or outside the range. 
and uh, uh, and therefore the transfer pricing depends upon the multinational company and how they uh, it's more like a guessing uh, game between the multinational company and the host company government to what is acceptable range and uh, how the multinational company can defend uh, uh, their, their price by uh, by preparing the document and ready to defend the price when the tax of will come into their, their company into the door. So uh, this kind of multiple regulator with a different rule create a huge tax and a penalty risk for the multinational company. Okay, uh, this uh, transfer pricing uh, uh, also pose uh, uh, also risk and also opportunity for the academics, uh, just like me. So uh, we in the, uh, the academic research in the business schools are interested in understanding uh, how the multinational company operate and how the multinational company should use a transfer pricing to regulate the flows of goods and inputs across the country. So from the very theoretical perspective, this multinational, the, the very reason why the multinational company exists is to internalize the difference in the regulation and different law and the structural barrier. So this uh, kinds of uh, transfer pricing is, is quite natural for the multinational company to overcome and smooth out operation uh, through uh, many countries. But the problem is that, uh, the, you know, to, uh, as an academic, so we, we try to research the, the how much the company operate, how, to, how should they uh, decide their transfer pricing. And we also want to study whether it's transfer pricing is abusive or not. But oftentimes, uh, there's no uh, concrete data available for the transfer pricing. So obviously, the multinational company will not give you, uh, they uh, will not reveal you know, how they actually price their goods and imports. So we oftentimes uh, rely on the very aggregate figure or, or we rely on very indirect evidence or without relying on actual transaction data. So in the next couple of pages, uh, we show the previous study on the income shifting and the trade mispricing studies and also financial studies. So this is all the very important academic work uh, which has been done until this day. But the, uh, the conclusion is that, you know, if we found, uh, the researchers found some regularities such as, you know, if a country uh, raises the, the uh, corporate income tax and the profitability tends to, to become lower, and there is a more uh, wide evidence of transfer pricing when there is a more ready to use means. For example, like intangible assets such as like a technology or that contract, the uh, multinational company use those kind of intangible asset or, or, or debt servicing uh, contract as a way to, to, to move or uh, ship income in and out of the country. But these are very indirect evidence and often done at the aggregate level. So in the final page of our presentation, uh, so there are a couple of thoughts for the future research project. So I'm sure that uh, there are some, uh, several academics in the audience. So currently you know, we are focusing on the modeling and estimating impact of tax rule change on the strategy and performance, use the BEPS regulatory change, and also see how multinational companies use a tax strategy to, or to avoid the tax or save tax and uh, link to the firm performance. Uh, so uh, uh, I think the Steve is going to talk about the global value chain analysis and IP uh, migration and cash uh, pooling and cost sharing arrangement. So, and also, the, as an academics, we are making progress on the come up with a better methodology to estimate the abuse plans for pricing. So, this is our current research topic, but we also see some many opportunities in the future. 
For example, in the digital economy, uh, the transfer pricing uh, has become much more important issue because of many of the important asset moving uh, across the country are very intangible asset, such as the pattern, technology, or brand, and uh, management know-how. So how to price those kind of intangible assets in the digital economy has become a huge challenge for the academics as well as the practitioner. And also to looking at the tax payments from the CSR land. From the corporate social responsibility perspective, you know, not just the shareholder maximizing perspective, uh, what should be the more acceptable uh, transfer pricing scheme for the shareholder of the multinational company as well as the stakeholder, uh, in particular the national government. And uh, transfer pricing versus the general trading mispricing study, we, uh, we have more uh, future opportunity there. I think that lastly, I want to emphasize that you know there's a there's a light uh, at the end of the tunnel, and hopefully in the future we may have a better data. So at probably uh, uh, perhaps the Steve is going to explain in detail. Uh, there will be a country by country reporting on the value chain activity. And uh, such kind of data will be available uh, to the academics in the future. So if you have a much more concrete data at the, at the country level of their value chain activities and uh, how much tax, uh, tax they pay, then we will be have a better understanding of the transfer pricing uh, mechanism and how we are going to uh, determine whether it's abusive or not, and maybe uh, find a better way to harmonize interest between the shareholder and the stakeholders. Okay, so I will uh, finish uh, my presentation with a very high note, uh, with a uh, future research direction for the academics, and uh, I think that Steve and we're going to talk about from the multinational company's perspective how to use the model transfer pricing scheme and the research is going to talk about from the national government's perspective or the, how the, the national government is reacting to this kind of, you know, this kind of progress. So I will turn to uh, Steve, uh, but if I, uh, if, before I move, if there's any question I can, I'm ready to answer. Okay, thanks, uh, Xi Jin. Uh, this is uh, very important uh, to to also look at uh, how the academics look at uh, at the concept like transfer pricing, and particularly on a, on a, on an Apple case. Uh, my name is Dave Hybrex, and I'll take the next slot uh, before we uh, move to Richard. Uh, Richard uh, has been working with UNCTAD and uh, the OECD in the early days when uh, when BAPS was uh, was being investigated where uh, the UNCTAD uh, was was delivering some data points on foreign direct investments to the OECD to Pascal and his troops in the, in Paris uh, to assess uh, what structures were po possibly an abuse of uh, tax treaties or or um, um, favorable investment treaties um, and, and Richard will in, uh, in 50 minutes from now indicate uh, what uh, the, the update of that research uh, which he and his team has been doing for 15 what the results of that uh, updates uh, are. Before that uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, tax policy and tax boundaries. Uh, there's a picture where you see that uh, companies who and this is an IMF, uh, uh, IMF uh, uh, finance study. If uh, companies, um, sorry, if states levy tax uh, equal to 15% or higher of gross national product, then they have enough money to, to finance roads, um, educational and healthcare infrastructure. And, and therefore, uh, the government, by levying tax, is contributing to the uh, infrastructure of a country and facilitates growth of the private sector as well. Um, you also have those regimes where there's, uh, as I call it, there's only one highway in the city, in the in the country, from the in international air airport to the palace of uh, of the ruler of that country. 
that typically means there's no normalized tax regime and not likely to be one soon. So that's, that's the two bottom boxes which says, okay, you need to levy at least 15% of your gross national product to facilitate uh, the private sector being, uh, being fully operational. On the other side, and that's why it's colored red, you see the US, Japan and Italy, which have um, in nominal terms very high tax rates. Um, with especially Italy and Japan, you see that the high tax rate is, is creating certain side effects, and the side effects could be uh, all um, uh, referred to as low growth. Uh, the U.S. typically has a high tax regime, but that has found a way uh, to uh, call it subsidize uh, the, the U.S. headquarter companies for their outbound uh, investments. So the U.S. allows um, certain structures where the, on, on the U.S. income, 40% of uh, income tax is applicable, and on the non-U.S., uh, a lot lower income tax rate will be applied. And that's something we will illustrate in a minute on, on the Apple case as well. Um, the fact uh, is uh, that this, this um, U.S. Uh, regime is supported by, if you look at the all stock quoted companies in the U.S., uh, do carry a tax rate uh, typically between 20 and 24%. Um, which gives an indication that uh, if they would be paying on 50% of their income, let's assume that's the U.S. portion, 40%, and they pay uh, about 8% uh, on the other portion, then you get to 24% uh, in, the, in, the, in totality. Uh, so that's, that's what makes the uh, U.S. still uh, a very attractive uh, um, a country, uh, although the tax rate is very high. Well, given these tax boundaries, um, you, you can uh, assume that uh, anything uh, which is below 15, I think that's the essence of, of BAMS, any tax rate below 15 will be looked at with more, uh, more interest by government authorities than, uh, than uh, other structures. Um, on on the, this slide, you see sort of the whole lineup of activities where um, the, the, the pace at which these uh, final reports, which were, were published in October 15 uh, uh, last year, um, a lot of the pace at which these uh, reports are being converted into local countries differs very much. If you take uh, a few examples, you take China, for example, China has introduced as part of Action 13, which is TP documentation, a full value chain analysis being mandatory um, effectively for all transactions after 1-1-2016. If you look on the other side of the ocean, uh, uh, since I'm in Amsterdam, and uh, you look at the U.S., uh, then the U.S. has just uh, launched uh, C by C reporting, and I will be in, uh, in New York uh, next week to, uh, to do, run a workshop on how to fill in the table one, two, and three of this famous country-by-country uh, country reporting. So uh, th this is the long list. The, the, the big question is whether, and that's Action 15, the multilateral instrument, uh, which is a, an, an instrument which tries to introduce all of these new concepts which are embodied in these reports into the, the tax uh, arena uh, overnight. So the intention was by the end of this year or early next year that all the G20 OECD countries would sign a multilateral instrument agreement which would implement all these new concepts instantly and, and also being applicable on, uh, on, on each and every bilateral situation. Uh, so that's, that's still uh, an area where uh, some, some work has to be done. If we now uh, look at uh, the next slide and we say, okay, what are the BAP sensitivities on uh, preferential tax regimes? And this is uh, like a highlight on Action 5. We look at examples, the Netherlands, Ireland, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Malta, uh, in Asia, Hong Kong, Mauritius, and Singapore, and the BVI Bermuda, I think, are, are the, the usual suspects 
just to put things into the the more historical perspective how this this how did this all come to the table well we had the UK Congress which was well, like the first tsunami of transparency on tax matters with interviews to uh, uh, to a few of the, the companies on the, on this uh, on this slide like Google then the, the, the Apple CEO uh, was trained for a couple of days to appear in front of the US Congress to explain why and how they believe they are a good corporate citizen in, in the US and then G20 OECD picked up uh, the BAPS project where uh, I think in in hindsight the EU, EU Commission picked up that signal and started um, accusing some of US mostly US based companies of uh, having received state aid uh, by certain countries in uh, in the in the EU uh, which are the cases uh, we will look at at least we will zoom into the Apple case now so these are the uh, the, the ways where the focus on full uh, transparency on tax sensitive data is is the norm um, as, as you can imagine the academic world uh, CGN is, is, uh, um, is representing has a hard time finding all this data on the other side uh, established institutes like UNCTAD have certain ways to to crunch big data and get some some clarity on uh, on how countries uh, and governments sorry uh, corporates are using certain stepping stones to uh, lower their effective tax rate um, this slide is a very simplification of uh, of the Apple case uh, Apple uh, sent uh, sorry sells in Europe through an Irish uh, company uh, that and this is covering the period 2009 2014 um, it has a uh, an, an interesting structure where there was in, in the beginning about 1,000 people in Ireland uh, the presence on the ground in the various European countries was limited to uh, to an Apple flagship store or a authorized Apple reseller which typically was a, a third-party reseller in the in the market um, Typically on flagship stores you would expect the cost of those to be charged back at cost plus uh, to in this case Ireland uh, There was a special uh, arrangement with the Irish Fisk uh, for the, the years 2009 uh, 2007 first uh, which basically meant Apple was the biggest taxpayer in the Irish territory by applying a cost plus uh, 62 on the on the cost relating to those thousand workers which were on the payroll of uh, of, uh, of Apple Ireland and for the subsequent period uh, the period 2010-2014 um, there was a cost plus 10 to 20 percent being applied as an agreement with the Irish tax authorities um, the Role of uh, the Irish comp the Irish Irish incorporated company, which was effectively managed and controlled out of Bermuda, which is the number four on this slide. Uh, that entity that had office uh, in in uh, established in Bermuda uh, had been and has been entering into a cost sharing agreement for that period with the U.S. parents. Uh, EA it it held the IP rights to be exploited for the rest of the world including the Apple name the designs and everything else um, if you look at the numbers the numbers are uh, hypothetical but sort of give you the idea if the gross sales in Ireland are 1 million uh, the kickback ultimately landing in uh, in Ireland Bermuda the number four company the f number four box uh, have a royalty income uh, of about 850 so that that means there's quite a big chunk although most of the people functions are in Ireland there's quite a big chunk of the total 1 million uh, which is being paid back to this Irish Bermuda company and again coming back to the uh, the, the first slide I've uh, explained uh, there is a big uh, pot of, of cash uh, in on a bank account in, in Bermuda which 
if and insofar that cash is not being repatriated to the US, it will not be subject to 40% of corporate income tax. Um, if and to the extent that uh, amount of cash is being permanently reinvested into um, um, non-US uh, territory, you can delay paying tax in the US for quite a long period of time. Uh, I think even there was a case where Apple needed to pay dividends and uh, rather than repatriating money from Bermuda, they just lent some money in the, in the marketplace because that was a cheaper way of funding their dividends. Um, th th this is all pretty factual, so there's no uh, statement of, uh, of uh, any judgmental statement because this is a normal way on which U.S. multinationals facilitated by the U.S. tax law and regulations uh, can get to an effective tax rate between 20 and 24. Um, if we look at the, the next slide, then the question is a little bit, okay, if the EU Commission now is challenging the Irish state, um, you need to go back to Apple and get $13 billion back um, because we believe you had a selective uh, economic benefit given to one taxpayer which was not given to any of the other taxpayers. Uh, the, the assessment by the EU is really an, not an assessment of Apple but it's an assessment by the EU Commission of the, the conduct by the, uh, by the Irish uh, tax authorities. So that's the, that's the, the, the discussion on state aid. So either, and then at least two options at the level of Ireland, uh, Ireland can either go to Apple and say, please pay me $13 billion. Um, just to clarify that $13 billion, uh, if that is paid by Apple, very likely uh, that's going to be eating up this cash amount in Bermuda. Um, uh, in, eventually when that cash from Bermuda goes back to the US, that $13 billion gets credited against the US tax rate of 40%. So not surprisingly uh, on this case, the IRS uh, has been writing a, a white paper where they basically have challenged this, uh, this claim by the EU because at the end of the day, it's not Apple paying the bill, but it's the IRS paying the bill if these profits uh, will be repatriated from Bermuda to the US. So the debate is not um, EU Commission Apple, it's the EU Commission versus a state which uh, according to the EU has given state aid, so a selective economic benefit in this case to Apple, uh, which makes the, the, the whole dispute a little bit confusing for uh, a lot of the readers. If we move to the next slide and um, I've just analyzed a lot of newspaper articles and uh, I said okay there might be four ways of looking at uh, this Apple case. You might uh, hold the view that the 850 royalty income landed in Bermuda is just a fair uh, payment for intellectual property for the name Apple for the design rights and it will be taxed uh, upon repatriation to the US, which is the normal system and that's pretty much, I think, um, from a US perspective, how the, 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 the corporate Apple and other US corporates look at uh, this particular case. Uh, so they don't see the worry other people see and, and, and obviously the newspapers write about. Then the Second view, which is probably a little bit more political view, is that some of that 850,000 or 841, 500 of royalty income should have landed in a tax return in the various EU countries. Well, that's uh, that is a challenge. Why? Because of the the, the lack of of physical presence. Um, uh, Apple seems to have, except for the the, the Mac, uh, the AMAC uh, uh, flagship stores, and and the third-party authorized resellers who 
uh, typically get a five to ten percent margin for all the products they sell in uh, in the in the audio visual space. Um, that's basically the, the the amount which the uh, the distribution channel is already getting uh, paid uh, by Apple, uh, although most of those are third parties. Uh, because Apple runs uh, some own stores, but a lot of it is uh, authorized resellers being third parties. Um, the, the next discussion you are having is, okay, maybe a, a, a little bit more income should be reported in Ireland, because Ireland was running uh, in the beginning with 1,000 people, uh, a little later towards uh, 2014 with 5,000 people, the whole supply chain. So it was... Uh, interacting with Foxconn in China, who was assembling the uh, iPhone. Uh, they made sure that the whole logistics worked, so the iPhone came to Europe and was sold through an AMAC uh, flagship store or for, through uh, an audio reseller like uh, MediaMarkt uh, into, into the local European marketplaces. So that's, that's a discussion you could, uh, you could see happening as we speak. Um, the, the third view uh, is pretty much uh, that uh, the EU was not looking at all at, at the vision one or, or the view two, but was really only saying, okay, we think you Irish state gave a selective economic benefit to one particular p a taxpayer, uh, which no, none of the other taxpayers and I think the EU used a little bit of wider definition of, uh, of uh, selective economic benefit. Uh, you can compare Apple to other multinationals, but I think the EU here used as a reference um, that Apple got a, an economic, a selective economic benefit compared to all taxpayers in Ireland. And that made the uh, criteria it applied slightly different from previous cases uh, how to apply state, the state aid concept. So that's the, the EU view uh, on, on the whole Apple case. Uh, last but not least, uh, I, was, I was doing uh, uh, involved in the OECD repre representation in the year 1997 when uh, the OECD was already discussing uh, uh, the different treatment on, on digital economy like, uh, like this Apple model comes fairly close to that to that whole setup, um, uh, although it's still very tangible because of the uh, physical products being traded. There's a huge IP component uh, in, in the whole setup. Um, so in 1997, uh, there was a OECD conference in Finland. Um, it took the OECD until 2005 to basically say digital economy and all these configurations is business as usual. That's about eight years. Uh, then eight years later, that was the year 2013, the OECD started all over again with, uh, as you know, Action 1 on digital economy with, as a result, 250 pages of uh, very interesting analytics, but no conclusions at the end uh, because there was no uh, compromise between the G20 and OECD member states on how to take this forward. So at this stage, I would say that um, also from a regulator's perspective, the OECD uh, and, and particularly the EU members part of the OECD have missed an opportunity to change the rule of the game, how to tax uh, business configurations like this. So in short, the views are uh, one is probably a technically a tax technically correct interpretation, certainly from a U.S. perspective. The second probably is, and that's what Xi Jin mentioned, to the, the the morality of the case. That's the political correct statement, at least in Europe, people uh, like to believe. The state aid has has really nothing to do with one and two, uh, but is a a the only tool the EU has to assess uh, uh, governments if, if they believe governments are involved in unfair tax competition. Um, and the fourth one is basically a, a, regulator, a regula regulator's perspective where we, we should conclude that the EU, as well as the G20, as well as the OECD, has, have 
again missed an opportunity uh, 16 years later when uh, when they uh, were talking in Finland 16 years ago again in 2013-15 uh, have missed an opportunity to, to change the rules of the game. There's one last development and that's uh, where Apple apparently has been talking to the EU Commission uh, where the EU Commission is coming back with an old plan from 2011 where it says okay why don't we allocate a taxable income not based on, on this functions, risks and assets because it gets very complex in a space like that but why don't we do the common, uh, the common tax base and, and start uh, using certain allocation keys to allocate uh, profits uh, from in this case the non-US Apple um, activities uh, to the various EU countries. I think that's, that's sort of the EU again maybe in a more political mode moving into their view on, on the Apple case. I think with that uh, I like to finish and hand over unless there's any questions. Uh, let's look uh, Mary at the panel whether there's any questions. Uh, the attendees I just remind, would like to remind you that you can ask your questions through the GoToWebinar control panel. There is a tab question. Please feel free to type them and we will answer them. Thanks, Mary. Um, Richard, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, so, uh, just a very brief introduction. Um, I'm in the Investment and Enterprise Division in uh, the UN in Geneva. Uh, this division does uh, many things, uh, mostly um, related to providing policy advice to uh, developing countries on investment policy, um, uh, supporting intergovernmental processes for international investment agreements, and we do research. We are a primary source for FDI data around the world, and we publish an annual uh, report, one of these big UN reports called the World Investment Report. Um, uh, this report every year has a special theme and uh, during the BEPS process uh, a few years ago um, we were asked by our member states to uh, also look into the work that the OECD was doing on BEPS and to see what would be the implications for developing countries and how we could contribute to BEPS to the BEPS process. Um, so we made uh, this topic um, our uh, theme topic for the World Investment Report in 2015 so what I will talk to you about today are a few findings from that 2015 report and I have added um, some more recent work from the uh, 2016 WIR um, that is relevant for the same topic. Um, so let me move into that um, and go to the next slide. Um, what you see on this slide is basically uh, our basic analysis from uh, the 2015 report which very simply constructed a very big global matrix of investment flows and stocks. Where do they come from which uh, you can see on the uh, vertical axis and where do they go to on the horizontal axis and we basically uh, split up all territories in the world into um, uh, well offshore financial centers and non-offshore financial centers and the offshore financial centers we split up into uh, tax havens typically OECD um, uh, designated uh, tax havens and um, uh, special purpose entities so these are actually not territories they are vehicles within that are offered in many territories actually most territories or countries around the world that uh, allow for the um, simplified uh, conduit or transfer of investments through a territory. Um, typical countries that offer SPEs of course are the most well known are the Netherlands, Luxembourg, um, uh, but you find them in practically ad all other countries in the world and they're just more important in certain countries. Uh, territories that have large through flows or transit flows are also Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, Belgium, UK, there is many around the world. So what you see here is basically um, a, a, a from-to type of picture of uh, global investment flows. 
And if I only look at the colored part of this matrix, the green and orange colors, uh, you can see that uh, of all productive investments in non-OFC countries, about a third uh, has first gone through um, offshore financial centers, or what, what the way we like to call them, offshore investment hubs. Um, but there's many ways of calculating this, and it all depends on the perimeter you choose for your offshore financial centers, of course. Um, you can find all this data, and you can play with all this data on our website, on our UNCTAD website, where you can also download um, a technical annex, and you can see that by using some measures and different ways of playing with this data, uh, you can see that some uh, up to two-thirds of all international investment flows is either sitting in or has been routed through so-called offshore investment hubs. So this is an extremely important phenomena in uh, international investment flows. Uh, a large part of uh, global investment is indirect. It doesn't come directly from a headquarter company to a productive location, but it first flows through some other location. So if I go to the next page, um, I can show you how this has important implications for measuring base erosion and profit shifting and for measuring the extent of possible tax avoidance by multinational enterprises. Um, we basically um, uh, looked at a method for assessing tax avoidance by uh, figuring out that, well, if one of the principal drivers for indirect investment flows is um, tax-efficient corporate structures, well, then I should be able to detect a correlation between reported rates of return on investment, which will be lower if there is profit shifting going on, and the amount of investment flows that has been routed through offshore investment hubs. So what we measure on this graph, this is just an illustrative graph of what we did, was basically to uh, look at countries' inward investment, inward foreign direct investment, and we found that for every 10 percentage point of that inward investment that has been routed through some offshore investment hub, or i.e. that has arrived indirectly, the reported rate of return on FDI was one percentage point lower. Right? So that's a clear indication that um, through the efficient corporate structures created through indirect investments, um, companies are able to um, shift some profits away and to report lower, uh, lower profits. Um, and knowing this coefficient, 10 percentage points versus 1 percentage point, um, you can easily calculate what would be um, the estimated amount of taxes avoided simply by applying an average effective tax rate for each country in the world. And we found that around 90 to 100 billion taxes would be avoided in developing countries alone. Of course, as, as UNCTAD, we are mostly interested in the developing countries. But we also found that if you look at it worldwide, um, the Wall Street Journal took our method and uh, applied it worldwide and came to approximately 200 billion. So it's, uh, it's, um, that would be the overall estimate. And these numbers are not very different from some estimates provided by other institutions. And then I'm talking about both OECD estimates and I'm talking about estimates by institutions like NGOs, like the Tax Justice Network. So. Uh, if you find yourself about in the middle between the Tax Justice Network and the OECD, you know you're approximately right. Um, now, the methods we estimated here um, are uh, were then taken up in the OECD Action 11 report. Action 11 was the, the part that deals with measuring uh, BEPs, and uh, so uh, the method of doing that through FDI was taken up as one potential avenue for doing this. Uh, so this was the, uh, our contribution to this story. So if I move on to the next uh, slide, um, here, as you can see from the different layout of the slide, I'm actually looking at some work we did for this year's World Investment Report. All of this also, of course, freely available on the UNCTAD website, including all the, uh, the, the technical details behind it. And here we, uh, rather than looking at macro level FDI flows as we did in the previous chart. Here we looked at firm level data. So we look at uh, about 
um, well, we had a database of about four and a half million affiliates of companies, all based on the Orbis database. Um, and we figured out, okay, look at the foreign affiliates in that enormous set of multinational affiliates and see how um, these affiliates are owned, through what structure are such foreign affiliates owned. And we found that about 40%, just over 40% of all foreign affiliates around the world is owned through some indirect um, intermediate owner that is not located um, uh, in, in, the, in the home country. So it's located in some third country. So there has been the same type of indirect routing that we showed at macro level in the previous chart, you can see at the um, uh, micro level in this chart. Moving on to the, to the next page from here. Um, and the nice thing about looking at firm level data is we can say some more things about uh, large multinational enterprises and how they are structured. So this is data on what we call the top 100 multinationals. And you can see, for example, that um, this top 100 multinationals, the largest companies in the world, have on average uh, around 550 affiliates. Um, and they have on average about 56 countries in their network and are just under 70 affiliates in the widest possible perimeter of offshore financial centers and about 20 holding companies in their structure. So what does this tell us? This tells me that basically this phenomenon of indirect investment uh, flows and the phenomenon of co complex corporate structures is systemic. All companies do this and actually, you know, many people are surprised when they hear this, but if I think about it more logically, you know, just economics 101, and you know, if you can do something more cheaply, you will do it, right? So I'm actually, you would actually be surprised that there is investments where it is not used, right? But it is, it's a systemic phenomenon of international investment. And given the importance of international investment, what we said in our conclusions was, we have to actually be really careful in tackling this. So all of the measures that are being taken uh, in BEPS, in the EU, and in other fora on tackling um, uh, indirect investment flows and complex corporate structures. Um, these are all necessary because we, we of course, need to uh, try to um, uh, improve and tackle uh, tax um, At the same time, we don't want to damage international investment. We very much need international investment. And we need it for two reasons. One, if I go to the next slide, I can also show you that uh, we shouldn't just look at BEPS, at uh, base erosion and profit shifting. We should also look at the contribution that multinationals and their foreign affiliates make in their host countries to tax, uh, to fiscal uh, budgets. And uh, we did that here. I will move quickly on. But in the same report uh, a year ago, we estimated that uh, in addition to the 100 billion of uh, taxes being avoided in developing countries, there was still some 700 and 30 billion taxes that were being paid by multinationals in developing countries left over after that. So that's important. Uh, that's one important aspect of uh, making sure we don't take measures that are too drastic. And the next important aspect is on the next slide. Um, and that is that simply we need a lot of investment. Everyone's talking about investment facilitation. Um, I think that the policy focus in the next few years in international organizations, um, uh, among international uh, policy makers, will be very much on investment facilitation. And that is because, uh, simply, if we look at international investment, um, while uh, global GDP since the financial crisis is well back up um, uh, over the level it was at in 2007, uh, trade flows are back up over the level of 2007, but global investment is still 10% below what it was in 2007. So we need more investment and we need to recover. We have still not recovered from the crisis. We need more investment for sustainable development and we need to realize that there is an enormous gap in international policy on investment facilitation measures. So this is our, um, our, our overall conclusion. Uh, yes, we need to tackle uh, BEPS, base erosion, profit shifting. We need to tackle tax avoidance. At the same time, we need to make sure that we do continue to keep 
an international policy framework that continues to facilitate investment. Um, I'll round up with that. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. This is great. Uh, I think we, we are uh, reaching the uh, uh, 5 o'clock European time. Sijin, any final uh, conclusions or comments from your end before we close? Uh, I, I think that probably uh, you may want to explain a little bit more about uh, country by country value uh, chain analysis. That may have uh, implications to the practitioner as well as the academics. Uh. Very good. Thanks very much, uh, Rishat, uh, Sijin. Uh, thanks very much as an as an audience, and we uh, we welcome you back to one of our uh, uh, subsequent webinars over the the coming weeks on uh, on value chain analytics. And uh, thanks to Rishat and Sijin for uh, for willing to participate, especially Sijin from uh, Shanghai. So thanks very much, and this is the close of this session. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.